the thing about novelties in particular is, you know, they do open up these imaginative worlds. So they introduce you to things that you never saw before that you couldn't even conceive of. Wendy Wollison is a historian, professor, and author of the fascinating book, Crap, A History of Cheap Stuff in America. The classes she teaches at Rutgers University Camden are described as the history of material and consumer culture, used goods markets, alternative and criminal economies, and the history of capitalism. Today, Wendy and I will do a little post-Christmas analysis of American consumer habits and dive deep into our historical obsession with, as Wendy so artfully puts it, crap, or the mostly pointless, poorly made products that we continue to buy year after year. Our last episode covered sea monkeys, a product that belongs to the category of novelty goods. You know, your x-ray specs, your fake vomit, your exploding cigars. So now we're going to go into much more detail analyzing these definitively American items, what they mean about our history and society, and how we move forward as an enormous culmination of all our plastic crap floats out in the ocean, growing larger every day. I'm your host, Chelsea Weber-Smith, and this is American Hysteria. Hi, Wendy. Thank you so much for joining us today. I really appreciate you coming on the show. Thank you for having me. I'm delighted to be here. Oh, I'm, I'm so glad. So I've been reading your book the last couple weeks. As I mentioned to you, we're working on a Sea Monkeys episode, which, you know, is in the universe of your book. Sure. And I came across so much fun stuff about kind of the novelty industry and the history of kitsch and how our culture kind of adapted to the new capitalist structure that we had and how a lot of that came out in cheap goods that were sort of useless. And I think that, you know, we all have different relationships to these seemingly useless items mm -hmm. that many people find a lot of joy and love in. And Absolutely. other people, you know, for me personally, I walk into like a gift shop and I'm surrounded by what you so eloquently call crap in your book. And it's oppressive. I feel oppressed by the <laughs> amount of stuff in there. And uh, but I also love to collect, you know, totally useless novelty crap. So I, I feel like I fall in this middle ground. But what about you, Wendy? How did you get so interested in this idea of crap <laughs> that we will define very soon? How did you get into wanting to understand how American culture has has come to be the way it is in terms of these types of goods? Yeah. So thank you for the question. So I've always been interested in material culture and stuff. I grew up in a family of collectors. My grandparents were antiques dealers. So, you know, I sort of grew up conditioned to the world of goods. And as a scholar, I've always been interested in material culture, consumer culture, people's relationships to their material world over time. And the more I researched different aspects of this, the more I became kind of frustrated because the information that I found really focused on high-end things, nice things, fine art, paintings, you know, masterpieces, really nice antiques, Fabergé eggs, and, and that kind of thing, which, sure, those are really wonderful, beautiful things that don't really need to be explained or kind of justify themselves. But for most of us, we can't afford those things. And those are not the things that we surround ourselves with for various mm -hmm. reasons, but mostly because they're they're out of out of reach for us. And I was sort of surprised that nobody had worked on, you know, what I call sort of vernacular material culture, the ordinary stuff that you and I surround ourselves with every day. And the more I got thinking about this, the more I felt like I could tell an almost not to get sort of high-minded or anything, but almost an intellectual history 
of ordinary people through these goods. And so that's how I got interested in it. And of course, also, it was, um, I don't want to say it was a complete lark, but it seemed kind of (laughs) funny to me. It seemed like there were a lot of possibilities to do some really fun things with this topic and to go down all sorts of really interesting rabbit holes. Oh, definitely. And and speaking to your uh, high mindedness, I <laughs> wanted to say that the what really got me into your book is that I was looking, you know, for my sea monkey information oh, and yeah. I went and you don't cover much about sea monkeys in your book, but you have this beautiful part where you're talking about the sea monkeys and the resurrection plant and yeah. the other kind of crypto biosis uh, items that were offered. And you said that it was like, I can't remember your exact wording, but you talked about how people were like buying this ability to create life. And right. I thought that was really, I just, I was like, all right, we got to have Wendy on the show because <laughs> this is our shit right here. This is perfect. Yeah. So I really, uh, I appreciate, I want you to bring all of that. Please bring your okay. metaphors, bring your high-mindedness. That's what we're here for. <laughs> okay. So before we get into the history of what you call crap, Could you do your best to define what you consider to be crap? So we're all on the same page. We're all on the same page. Yeah, Yeah. (laughs) I think that's that's important. And maybe we won't be on the same page when you hear my explanation. (laughs) But, you know, it'll give us something to work with, or at least it'll kind of convey the way I'm thinking of crap. And I always want to, you know, when I talk about this and when I speak to audiences, I always want to qualify this by saying that even though crap itself is a pejorative term, in the book, I'm not trying to be judgmental. I'm trying to let people at the time speak for themselves about the qualities that they thought were positive or negative about certain goods. And so, and the things that I consider crap aren't necessarily the things that you might consider crap. And so it's relative. But that's not particularly useful to say, Mm -hmm. oh, it's all completely subjective. So I do I do have some kind of measurements or metrics that I use to define crap. And so for me, there aren't certain things that are crap and certain things that are not crap. It is a state of being of a certain thing. And so the relative crappiness of something is the distance between what it promises to be Mm. and what it actually offers. Mm -hmm. And so there are different sort of valences of crap. Something can be crappy in different ways. So for example, a gadget that's maybe a multi-tool. I spent a lot of time in my book talking about multi-tools. They promise to do all sorts of things, you know, 10 tools in one. This can slice and dice and, you know, be a screwdriver and a hammer and all these things. But a multi-tool actually usually doesn't do any of those things very well, right? (laughs) Or another example from the world of gadgets is something that promises to do a kind of labor easier than doing it by hand or something. Mm -hmm. But what we see is that it often creates more work. Like if it's a kitchen gadget, it's harder to clean, Um, It might have all sorts of parts. It might fall apart really easily. And in the end, it might, you know, that like trick garlic peeler is more trouble than it's worth. (laughs) Right, right. So those are a couple of examples. So again, to me, it's like the distance between what something promises and what it actually delivers. Crappiness is um, a kind of quality of cynicism Mm. of objects. Mm -hmm. These are things that are often cynically made, made not to last, made to be replaced rather than repaired. And so they don't offer us what we often hope that they will. But there's a low barrier to entry. Most crappy things are also very cheap. So the risk to us versus the reward is something that we can um, pretty easily calculate. And we often, you know, will like go to the dollar store and, you know, buy a new set of he- little cheap headphones or some little trinket or gadget thing because it's funny. And we can pay, you know, a couple of bucks for it. And that's not going to really causes any financial hardship. So the risk is really low. And so we tend to buy a lot more of these things Mm. that we often 
don't really want and right. often don't really need. Right. I mean, I would say that just to bring it back to our darling sea monkeys, that that's yeah. a pretty good. I mean, not to say that people haven't gotten hours weeks, years, perhaps, of joy yeah. out of sea monkeys, but they promise, you know, this magical family that's going to live with you in their oh, castle, and what know. they deliver is brine shrimp, but it's for, like, a dollar fifty. so it's like, well, you know, it, it's not a it's not a huge loss, so I feel like I do feel like sea monkeys, bless their hearts, fall into our crap category. I mean, and the advertising for sea monkeys is great. It's like this little oh, family great. in Atlantis living, you know, you want, you want these creatures, you know? You do. I know. And <laughs> you're right. Like, and then they end up being brine shrimp and kids are <laughs> Okay. <laughs> All right. Well, you know, that's, that's, I mean, what do we expect? I guess it's, it is an early lesson. I think it was an early lesson for many children yeah. in the dubious nature of advertising. So maybe it has value in that way. Okay. So let's start at whatever you consider, and I, I'm sure that this could go back eons, but whatever you consider in American culture, the beginning point of when we started to develop what we are calling crap. Yeah. So one of the things that I discovered, and I think surprises a lot of people, is that crappy stuff has a really long history. You know, so a lot of people think, oh, the invention of plastic stuff in the 20th century or stuff that comes from China in the late 20th century, the rise of the dollar store. All of these things have a much, even the dollar store has a much, much longer history that takes us back. My study is focused on the U.S., so it takes us back in American culture to the first decades of the 19th century. Mm -hmm. And really after the War of 1812. And I don't want to get into the weeds here, but during the war, we had an embargo. And so there were no British goods allowed to be imported into the country. Now, people got around that through, you know, different kinds of underground economies and things like that. But for the most part, this was an era before American industry really got going. So we weren't making a lot of stuff ourselves in this country. We were relying a lot on the import of goods from overseas, and in particular, Great Britain. Mm -hmm. So we have this war with them, so we're certainly not going to trade with them. So it's very hard for Americans at this time to get new goods. Mm -hmm. After the war, there's all this pent-up consumer demand Plus, there's all sorts of stuff in British warehouses that's just been sitting there during the war. It's stuff that they haven't been able to sell to us. Sometimes, in some cases, it was stock that merchants weren't able to sell to British consumers. So this might have been pieces of chinaware with chips mm -hmm. or fabrics that had faded, you know, sort of what we would call kind of second tier as is goods that mm -hmm. were defective in some way. And so these merchants just exported that stuff to our country. And the American market sort of exploded with these cheap goods. And American consumers went a little bananas. They really <laughs> wanted this stuff. And we start to see in the 1810s and 18 teens the first appearance of what were called cheap goods stores, variety goods stores. So these were stores that were offering all sorts of things. If you look at the newspaper advertisements from the time, they're just like lists and lists and lists of all sorts of miscellaneous stuff, thimbles, uh, gold-plated pencils, nutmeg graters, uh, bird cages miscellaneous yards of lace, you know. And so the argument I make in the, my book is that it's this combination of cheap price, physical accessibility, because more people were able to get these goods because they were filtering from East Coast port cities into the hinterlands um, through peddlers, and variety that created this almost like treasure chest kind of effect mm. where everything cheap and sort of humble as it may have been, it was almost like these potential little treasures that people could have. Yeah. 
And at the same time, Americans, like a lot of people living at that time, didn't have a lot of stuff. They lived with very few things, material goods. They might have a Bible and an almanac, for example, unless they were really rich, they didn't have a library of books. They might have a small mirror, maybe. They might have a table in their kitchen that was used as a workbench during the day. People would eat their meals on it at night, and then it might be converted into a bed, you know, overnight. Mm -hmm. So the point is that people had fewer goods. They were meant to last. And people took much better care of those things. They were the caretakers of these goods. And so pieces of furniture would get handed down from generation to generation. They would be repaired. They would be well cared for. Clothing in the same way would be refashioned over time. It would be redyed. It would be repaired when something could no longer be repaired. An outfit would be taken apart and re-sewn to fit somebody smaller. Mm -hmm. And when that fabric had finally outlived its life as an article of clothing, it was sold to the rag dealer and the rag dealer would convert those rags into paper. Oh, Yeah. So objects had afterlives and the things that they were made out of allowed them to be repaired, to be refashioned and to be recycled. Unlike today. Right. So the infusion of these new goods into the market exposed people to new things, more things, different things. It stimulated them in a way that material goods hadn't before. And this is like, I'm talking about like ordinary people. For the rich, sure. they could always afford nice stuff, new stuff, you know, sort of turning over their things, even though they too were fairly conservative about um, the goods that they surrounded themselves with. More after this. And now back to the show. What I'm hearing too is like, there is a really different, like almost psychic relationship to these two different kinds of goods. Like there's the goods that have been around forever that are fixed, that are cared for. And that feels like almost it's a part of your family. Like it's an extension yeah. of your family. It's familial. It's imbued with a certain kind of meaning. But then you right. have these other types of goods that are imbued with this novelty and this newness right. and this excitement. Right. And I imagine there was a lot of grappling that happened for ordinary people between those two categories. For sure. For sure. You're absolutely right. There were huge ruptures in how people thought about this. Some people welcomed this new consumer culture with open arms, couldn't wait to get more. And I think that's one of the things that really strikes me about this story is that these new goods opened up new worlds to them, new possibilities. It gave them variety in the things that they could look at Peddlers sold things that were called Yankee notions, thimbles or buttons made out of mother of pearl or miscellaneous yards of lace, painted tinware, things that were like really nice. They weren't extravagant, but they were like really nice to look at and to sort of have, especially if you're not used to having kind of pretty and nice things. And again, they were accessible both physically and economically. Mm. While other people freaked out about this, and especially, again, if we go back to gadgets, you see a lot of this discourse in gadgets where people were talking about, I don't want your newfangled devices. <laughs> so newfangled was this criticism of new things. And so for some people, especially people living in rural areas, you can sort of map this conservative versus more progressive um, attitude toward new goods. Mm -hmm. And, you know, farmers, for example, like the tried and true things that they had been, if it was good enough for my parents, good enough for me, it's good enough for the future generation. And so there were like practical reasons for that. And there were also kind of psychological and almost political reasons for that too. There was this, and we can get into this a little bit more when we talk sp more specifically about novelty itself, but you know, a lot of people 
feared the idea of novelty because it suggested to them a superficiality and a rapid change and sort of a, a lack of commitment, if you will, mm. to the way things were. Some people, it just like today, some people embrace change, love the uncertainty of the future, and others kind of dig in their heels. They don't want change. They have no problem with the way things have been. They're comfortable with stasis with either the present or the past. And it was no different at that time with consumer goods as well. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so right now where we are in history, are we still kind of in like the mid-1800s? Yeah. Okay, so like I'm guessing that some of these anxieties and maybe frustrations, maybe anger at um, the novelty has to do with the way that the greater landscape of American culture is changing with mm-hmm. like industrialization, I imagine. And yeah. so it feels like there's some direct connections between those that might be resisting mm-hmm. the novelty due to kind of being forgotten as Mm -hmm. part of an agrarian culture or whatever you want to say, um, do you feel like this was mirroring these types of bigger changes, like kind of acting as almost metaphors for that? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. One of the ironies I should say is that a lot of the most important innovations were in agriculture. Mm -hmm. So we're not talking, to be clear, about crappy things right now, but farmers ended up embracing new things and Mm. innovative machinery and because they because they had to to keep up. So I just I want to be careful that I myself am not painting this in too broad a brush. Yeah. But by the mid 19th century, that resistance gets just run over. Okay. The consumer revolution kind of amps up. We still have these these goods coming from Great Britain. Now the United States is manufacturing its own stuff. And by the mid 19th century, it really happens earlier. It happens by the 1830s, 1840s. Americans come to see themselves as consumers as much as producers. Mm -hmm. So it is a really significant change in the way that they conceive of themselves and their relationship to the market and their identity as Americans. And so Americans start to conceive of their importance and their role as political citizens and the way they can express themselves through the marketplace and through the world of goods. Yes. What they own, how they choose to dress themselves. And this is easier for them to do as goods become more accessible on the market, more and more goods, a variety of goods, those goods start to move inland. So they're no longer just concentrated in cities on the East Coast. So you have this sort of infiltration. And also what's important is that as goods become more available in different varieties, there's a new and more complex language of goods. So you were able to express yourself in new ways through you know, the material objects you're keeping company with. And in turn, People are starting to judge others Mm. by what they own and, you know, their taste, the quality of the goods, just their their choices. Mm. So by the mid-19th century, you really start to have this not just embrace of consumer culture, but an embodiment of that. Yeah, that's a good way to put it. It makes me think of how... There was this kind of psychological change during this time from a culture based around character and kind of what you do and then change it to personality based, which then I think would become obvious. It would become obvious that you would want to add these accoutrements to your Mm -hmm. personality to define yourself by uh, who you are, which was a new thing at that time, really, which I think. find endlessly fascinating and important and something we strangely don't uh, talk too much about. But yeah, it's interesting because it's like how much of it was because of the things that we were buying influencing it and how much of it was us influencing what we wanted to consume and buy, right? It's a strange, it's a hard question. Yeah. And I do think it was an iterative process. I'm always 
careful to remind people and to remind my my students, for example, that just because something was advertised doesn't mean that that people bought it just right. like today, you mm-hmm. know, and so I believe that consumers have had and have a lot of agency to make decisions for themselves. I think, but I think it's complicated because I do think that there are those pressures brought to bear. This knowledge, this sort of increasing self-consciousness, this knowledge that other people are possibly objectifying you or evaluating you, what you look like, the objects that you have, whether you want to play that game or not, Mm -hmm. it doesn't matter because other people are. Yeah. And so, you know, like today, they're judging you by the designer label on your jeans or, or what kind of car you drive. You might just want to be kind of in a neutral party in this consumer culture of ours, but you you can't be. Yeah. You can't be. That makes sense. Um, okay. So unless there's something you'd like to talk about between these two events, but I would love to talk about the development of specifically the novelty industry, sure. the pranks, the magic tricks, the yeah. big promises, uh, <laughs> the bad deliveries, and, uh, you know, that that kind of really one-of-a-kind industry at the time of, you know, things that appealed to a certain part of being human, uh, the novelty. So this is something that I'm I'm really interested in. And I had such a fun time writing the chapter on novelty goods that I'm trying to expand that now into a book length project. So one of the reasons why Sea Monkeys isn't in here is because I didn't have enough room for it. Yep. You got to give it its due, right? <laughs> I agree. Sea Monkeys, Magic Rocks, the whole, the whole thing. I find novelty goods really fascinating because they're so weird and they're really really hard to explain yeah you know as a scholar you try to figure out stuff why things exist why they existed when they did why they were popular and novelties are just so confounding in so many ways to me it makes it really a fascinating research topic so I'm not even sure when novelties I don't know when they were like when they were born I don't believe Like in in first or anything, you know, there are like a lot of different lineages that come together to, you know, create new things. So it's hard to really pinpoint where they come from. There's certainly a folk tradition in America of, you know, like creating, you know, carved wooden chains, for example, and puzzles that you could take apart. There's a German-American tradition of making what are called biting boxes, which are these wooden boxes and you open the lid and a snake with (laughs) with a nail on its nose jumps out and is supposed to like hit you in the hand and hurt you. So, you know, it's, it's harmful but funny sure, at the sure. same time which is which is a characteristic of of novelty goods um so you have like that thread you also have the thread of what i call in the book spicy novelties sexy stuff mm-hmm, sex stuff mm-hmm. and so there i've come across some catalogs from the early 1860s that are selling what they call mechanicals and i'm not exactly sure what they are but they must have been carved wooden like little figures that you could move and I'm sure they were like people having sex right Mm -hmm. um we start to see more of those things sold to civil war troops which makes sense so there start to be sellers of pornography and sex goods you know um condoms and things like that things called French ticklers, and also other kinds of spicy novelties that they would sell to soldiers in the field, which makes sense because these are, you know, homosocial kind of communities. They're young men. They're out in the field. They're, you know, engaged in this really serious, you know, pursuit of, well, you know, they're fighting a war, but their days are, you know, sort of boredom punctuated by Mm -hmm. extreme violence. They're away from the prying eyes of friends and family, so they can indulge in these things. It makes sense that there was a market for these kinds of things. And so that's kind of another thread of where some of these novelty goods come from. 
By the end of the Civil War and the the late 1860s, early 1870s, you start to see catalogs for novelty companies that are just selling these like wackadoodle things, Mm -hmm. not necessarily even spicy novelties, but, you know, uh, girl catchers or what they call Chinese finger traps. (laughs) The resurrection plants are pretty early, things called perfumed shells, which I don't know if they were like early forms of mothballs, trying to figure that out. There's, let me just say as an aside, there are a lot of these things that I don't quite understand you know i'm still Mm -hmm. trying to figure them out because they're so weird that's fun (laughs) other things like (laughs) fake spiders fake mustaches and fake beards were very popular Mm -hmm. masks fake teeth what they call goo goo teeth all sorts of things oh and magic trick Mm -hmm. magic tricks card games dice so it's all kind of interrelated but the point is that by the 1870s this gets to be a viable kind of business sector. Mm -hmm. So there are businesses that can just specialize in novelty goods that are sold to the public. Yeah. And something I was interested in hearing you talk about more is in your book, you have a section that talks about surrealism as kind of a part of novelty ads. And I, I mean, you gave an example, like these pages from maybe the Johnson, is it Johnson Smith company? Johnson Smith. Yeah. Yeah. Bananas. Yeah. It's like just an incredible picture of one of the pages of this catalog that, as you mentioned, is just like good after good after good with their little puffy one liner about them. But they do. They they are. It's like something you would want to paste on your wall or something. They're just these incredible pieces of art. And you relate it a lot back to surrealism. Is that something you'd be willing to talk about? Sure. Yeah. I'm looking at one of those pages now (laughs) from 1923. So just to give the listeners some idea of how weird these things are, if you haven't seen them. This is Johnson Smith put out really huge catalogs, but they also included advertisements in magazines like Popular Mechanics, you know, Mm -hmm. mostly geared toward boys, which we can we can talk about. But so here's one of these ads. It includes things like luminous paint, you know, so you can make things glow in the dark, serpent's eggs, the dying pig, the midget Bible stage money, an x-ray tube, a good luck ring, which is like a plastic ring with the shape of a skull and then rhinestone eyes, popular watch charms. These were like little tiny miniature telescopes. And you look, you look in them, they often had like racy pictures of like nude ladies and stuff Uh in them. (laughs) New book on rope splicing, magic flute, the resurrection plant. That's an evergreen. Mm -hmm. Cheap Pistols, Saturday night specials were often advertised, instructions to be a ventriloquist, bags of fabric scraps, one of the few things marketed to girls. Oh, yeah. These fabric scraps. Interesting. So one of the things that I that I say is that, or I, I liken novelties to surrealism for a few different reasons. And one of them is that if you were able to look at this, these ads, they include like tons of text and then these pictures and they're all just these odd juxtapositions of weird things sort of put together in weird ways so it causes this kind of whiplash and it's this excitement of creating these new kind of improbable relationships between goods so people are looking at these things things that they've never seen before often trying to figure out what they are, being really engrossed in the the deep text describing these things. And then the things all put together in this yeah. kind of amalgam, it just seems like a very surrealistic experience brought to the public in a way that was acceptable to them and in a way that wasn't called like capital S surrealism. Mm-hmm. And brought to them in a way that they were experiencing these new kinds of relationships in new worlds through goods well before like a decade at least before the art movement Mm -hmm. and in fact these earlier catalogs that i've seen from the 1870s and 1880s the same stuff is going on then too Mm -hmm. so you could say that surrealism 
is an art movement that catches up to the <laughs> yeah. sensibility of a lot of the public, or at least young boys who are really kind of pouring over these things. Another way that these things kind of, I don't know, echoed surrealism to me is that a lot of them are commodities that don't behave in proper ways. Mm. So, and what I mean by that is like, there are a lot of like exploding cigars and cigarettes, rubber gum, bouncing cheese, you know, exploding matchbooks, squirting cameras, squirting flowers, all these things that we're used to, but they don't behave like they're supposed to behave. Mm -hmm. They're acting not like their typical nature. And to me, that also has something of a surrealistic element mixed in with modern commodity capitalism. Yeah. You've kind of mentioned how obviously a lot of this was marketed more toward boys and mm -hmm. young men than girls. Um, yeah. I'm sure there are many reasons for that. But I think I'm especially interested in this culture that was appearing at the same time of pranks, right? So it was like mm -hmm. pranks itself, I'm sure, is a whole other book you could write, just like yeah, the psychology and history of that in America. But how do you see these novelty goods relating to that kind of growing masculine prank mm -hmm. trick culture that was happening at the time? Yeah, it's really interesting to look at it in, in that context. A lot of these novelty goods were meant for pranks. They were very performative. So yeah. there's a whole series of wounds, like the weepy eye or the cut off finger, you know, to, and, and the illustrations for those show like a man faking that he's hurt or something. And a woman kind of trying to be the caretaker, uh -huh. trying to make him, you know, feel okay. And so of course the funny thing is that he's eliciting the stereotypically feminine response and it's a joke. Like I'm, a hysterical I'm, response or something. Make, right, yeah. and a hysterical response. <laughs> also, that comes across really clearly in some of the illustrations that accompany um, the spilled ink, the fake mm. jar of spilled ink. And the text even says something like, you know, watch her go crazy when she thinks her favorite piece of furniture has been ruined. So funny. <laughs> I know. It's hilarious, right? Um, other ones are, I mentioned the squirting camera. That appears in a lot of novelty catalogs. And it's almost always illustrated with a boy behind the camera squirting the girl. Mm -hmm. I mentioned the, the, the girl trap. The text for that is basically something about like force her to talk to you by, you know, grabbing her finger in this right, way. Right, right. And so these things really were marketed to boys yeah. and really kind of, I think, both encouraged and picked up on the prevailing kind of pranking culture and one-upsman culture of emerging capitalism in the late 19th century. And I know some some listeners are going to be like rolling their eyes like, what, no, no. what is she talking about? Making Give us the capitalist critique. We're all here for right. it already. <laughs> but it really does fit into how boys were socialized into ideas of being good men. And you you aren't a good and successful man in capitalism if you are caring for the public good. Yeah. It's all about self-advancement. It's all about the profit motive. It's all about achieving your own aims in this sense that it's a zero-sum game. Getting one up on everyone else kind exactly. of thing. Exactly. Yeah. And so one of the arguments that I make in this chapter about novelty goods is that these things are very performative as a way to show your power over other people. Mm -hmm. So in order for like the pranking novelties to have effect, you need to have an audience. You need mm -hmm. to have a lot of people and you need to have a perpetrator and you need to have a victim. And the yeah. victim is either a woman or the victim is a weaker person among your sort of boy or male friend group. Right. And so that creates and then reinforces these hierarchies of power and dominance that will play out as these boys become adult. Mm -hmm. And so it's really interesting to me that the presence of girls 
in these novelty catalogs and in descriptions of how novelties were kind of enacted. Girls are are either victims or they're shunted off to the side and assumed to be consumers of like um I mentioned these these bags of textile remnants. Right. And we also see that in other toy catalogs. So if we're looking beyond just specifically novelty good catalogs, if we're looking at toy catalogs, it's really kind of uncanny the way that the toys for girls were dolls, sewing machines, brooms, Mm -hmm. stoves, things like that. The toys for boys were things like airplanes, cars, racetracks, balloons, guns, (laughs) carpentry sets. So things that to my mind, get them to look outward right. to a bigger imaginative world. And these novelty goods are also about these bigger imaginative worlds. Girls' toys bring them inwards toward the domestic sphere and inculcate in them ideas of domesticity and um, their prescriptive feminine roles that yeah. they are already doing as girls being caretakers for younger siblings, helping to cook, helping to clean. Boys aren't doing that. Well, and as problematic as that is, it does point to kind of what we thought of as the value of toys. You know, obviously, I don't like that we were forcing girls to learn only a certain set of skills, but we had an intention behind that skill of like, okay, this toy exists for you to learn this skill Mm -hmm. that will help you become an adult. Whereas it feels like by this time, boy toys had you know, some, you know, you you had your army men, sure, you had your guns, sure. you had these certain things, but then you also had, you know, the prank finger falling off that doesn't mm-hmm. feel like it's necessarily there to encourage any deeper uh, growth that right. might help them as adults. It feels like literally a, a novelty, something that, mm-hmm. you know, maybe would be defined as crap that doesn't have any kind of real meaning aside from it's like the thing that happens in the moment. And like you mentioned, it's like with a novelty prank, once you do it once, you know, you you could keep doing it to other people, but it does lose its magic almost Mm -hmm. immediately. Right. That's part of the point, you know, and some of these things like like um, fart powder literally disappear into thin air. And that's it. (laughs) They're gone. They're used up. So in some ways, like the novelty goods are the hardest to explain. But in other ways, I make the argument that they are the least crappy because Mm. they... They seem like they should be the the most crappy because they're so ephemeral, because they're so utterly useless. They can't really be explained. But... I don't know. I make this argument that actually it's the opposite, that that these novelty goods take us into much deeper and darker places Mm. than it seems on their face. So, for example, with the pranking, that's all supposed to be fun and games, right? But it's not. It's about power. These things can be very humiliating, embarrassing. Sometimes they can be harmful like itching powder actually they had to take that off the market because Mm -hmm. it was really dangerous there were some like uh, the earliest exploding cigars actually had explosives in them okay there were um fake auto car bombs that caused people to have like heart attacks they scared them so you know so it's like oh it's all in good fun but these things could be really harmful and then Another aspect of that is, you know, you have a whole kind of sector of novelty goods that are related to the body, you know, like big noses, the weepy eyes, the plastic vomit, there's, you know, fake dog poop and human poop and things like that. And so I make the argument that those things seem funny. They're a way to joke about the ephemerality of our bodies and the Mm -hmm. fact that our bodies are always in a state of decay. And as Americans, we, especially contemporary Americans, we have a very um, kind of difficult relationship with aging and death and disability and things like that. And through novelty goods, that was like one of our key ways of 
being able to address those very kind of deep and heavy issues, but in a way that was very lighthearted. Yeah. You're like venting an anxiety a little bit. Yeah. More after this. And now back to the show. So they do have some kind of a real power, even if they're not the power that we are sure. act, like attempting yeah. to get from them. There's like a, a relief valve of some kind. But unfortunately, yeah. there are many people in the crosshairs of someone trying to uh, get that kind of relief for their <laughs> exactly. underlying anxieties, as there always is. Um <laughs> Okay, so we've kind of covered the pranky side of novelty items. And another part of your book, and this is jumping around a bit in time, but when I was doing Sea Monkey novelty research, I did come across a lot of um, comic book ads that were Mm -hmm. offering free things like, oh, if you send this to enough friends, like, for example, you get a live monkey. That's something we cover in one of our episodes. That's terrifying. It was very dangerous. Um, But, you know, there was this idea that, you could get something for free. And I know that that extended beyond just kids. And that was a big popular thing. There were giveaways, rewards. Uh, What was that culture like? So, yeah, so that is another example of something that has a much, much longer history Mm -hmm. to it. And I I spent two chapters talking about free stuff because there, there are different kinds of free stuff. There's the free stuff that you get if you buy a certain number of products or a certain amount of something, you mm-hmm. get something else for free. And then there's the advertising premium, which is basically a little tchotchka, a little gadget or a pen or a tape measure ruler that has the name of a business imprinted on it. It's mm-hmm. free, but it's also advertising. So in both of those instances, this is free stuff, but it's not really free. Right. Right. So in the case of premiums, where we have, it's usually something very small, something we can put in our purses or our backpacks or something that can easily infiltrate into the home. This is a way to get advertising into our homes in a way that we look at this thing almost every day. Mm -hmm. So if it's a soap dish, it's going to end up in our bathroom and it's going to have the name of a business and maybe a logo. If it's a t-shirt, you know, we're going to be wearing that. And not only are we going to be reminded of that business, but we are free and mobile advertising. Right. They don't have to pay us. Mm -hmm. We often have to pay them through making a certain purchase or a minimum purchase of something. Right. So there, you know, so the argument that I make there, which isn't too surprising, is that, you know, free stuff isn't actually free and it comes at a cost. I mean, by the early 20th century, the things that you would send away for, they would send you that thing as a way to get your data. So even though it wasn't as sophisticated as today, Um, You would send in your coupon. They would have your name, your address. There were Mm -hmm. mailing list companies that did nothing but compile information, demographic information, and sell it to other companies. They got that from those little coupons, and those coupons had little codes, so they knew whether you saw this ad in Ladies Home Journal or Popular Mechanics or Good Housekeeping, so they could track how effective their advertising was being. Wow. That is yeah. more sophisticated than I had any idea. That, that's yeah. so cool. I mean, it's not cool necessarily, but it's very interesting that no, we have the, the same foundational yeah. activities happening in, in business and advertising. Yeah. And the same thing was happening with kids, um, companies saying, oh, if you send in your name and the name of 10 of your friends, we'll send you, you know, a little Mickey Mouse license plate with your name on it or whatever. Mm -hmm. That was a way to get your name and the name of all the people, you you know, your closest friends. So again, they're just leveraging that for data. Mm -hmm. And I can give you like a contemporary example. I was just at um, a store the other day, a spice, a spice store. And they're like, oh, we have this offer. We, We are giving away free cinnamon. And I was like, I was like, no, I'm thank you. I'm not buying anything. Oh no, we'll give it to you for free. You don't have to buy anything. You just have to give us your email address. Mm-hmm. And it's like, hmm. 
<laughs> is my email address worth free cinnamon? One of my friends did it and she said, I've gotten 10 emails already from this spice company. Wow. <laughs> Cinnamon, cinnamon, cinnamon. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> cinnamon wasn't really free. But... No, nope, nothing's free, right? <laughs> but this does kind of uh, betray a certain maybe American, maybe human quality that we want free shit we and we want, want shit. cheap shit. And so yeah. I'm wondering what you see. It, does that to you feel like a very American quality or is it more of a human quality? Mm -hmm. Like what is that impetus, that drive within us to just get? crap. Yeah, it's, you know, it's a good question. And people ask me this a lot, if this is like a particularly American thing. It's something I can't definitively answer, but I can tell you this. If it's not definitively American, we certainly do it better than anybody else. <laughs> We're number one. Yeah. <laughs> there is something about this idea of getting something for free. Like if, if it's a giveaway night at the stadium, you want to get there and you want to get your free, you know, bobblehead, even if you don't really want it, you feel like compelled yeah. to get it. And of course, they want to get you in that stadium early so that you're buying more food and you're buying yeah. more overpriced, you know, beer and everything. Um, so for, for them, it makes a lot of sense. We embrace free stuff and we also don't seem to have much of a problem of being these mobile advertisers that I mentioned. Mm -hmm. We have no problem, you know, carrying like product names on our jackets or our t-shirts or our tote bags. Oh my God, you know, think about all the tote bags, whether it's NPR or, mm -hmm. you know, something else. Speaking of which, we have new tote bags for sale, everyone. Oh, Please go awesome to our website. Merch, right? <laughs> yep, we do. <laughs> you got to have a tote. But we don't seem to have a problem with that. Americans, you know, ever since this longer history, at least dating back to the, the mid 19th century, if not earlier, Americans just embrace like we are consumers. Yes. And we've embraced that material culture with open arms and sort of have proudly proclaimed ourselves a nation of consumers. Mm -hmm. And so... Yeah, while I don't know if it's distinctly American, I think it's a huge American impulse. Yeah. To um not just embrace free stuff, but just embrace stuff altogether. And I can I can give you another kind of touch point here, which is that we have the largest and most burgeoning storage unit industry oh. in the world. Interesting. Okay. So we not only have our, you know typically bigger housings compared with the rest of the world for our stuff. Mm -hmm. But now we rent little apartments for the stuff that <laughs> <laughs> at least the way I look at it. Yeah, that's true. For the stuff that we can't seem to get rid of, mm -hmm. but we don't have room for in our houses. Yeah. And if you look at Americans' garages, and I don't have the percentage here, but it's a very high percentage of garages that don't have the cars in them because there's so much stock in the garage. Wow. So we have the both impulses to like gather new things, but yeah. then hold on to things that are also useless yeah. in some way. Right. Yeah. 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 OK. Interesting. That <laughs> sounds right to me. Yeah. OK. So are there any other big events like throughout the 20th century that you feel like really change our relationship to um, these cheap goods that we're obsessed with? Well, the internet, for one, mm -hmm. that's mm -hmm. a huge one when it comes to novelty. But maybe I can back up a little bit sure. and talk a little bit about World War II. Yeah, please. So let me go back a little bit further and just say with the rise of the five and dime store, mm -hmm. Woolworths and other competing chains, that happened in the 1870s, 1880s. A lot of those goods came from Germany, Austria, they all like made different things. Germans made cheap dolls, Austrians made cheap glassware, Czechoslovakia, also glassware, flowers, things like that. But Japan also was opening up its markets to mm -hmm. international trade for the first time. The Japanese started making things specifically for five and dime stores. So what they called wireware goods, so things like trash cans, bird cages, things like that, woven bamboo items, what they call dollar blouses, mm. sort of um, 
fast fashion before before fast <laughs> sure. fashion was thing. Cheap things like cocktail umbrellas, mm -hmm. shoelaces, that kind of stuff. And Japan was a key supplier of that cheap stuff for especially four, five, and dime stores until World War II. Okay. And then of course, nobody wants to buy anything made in Japan. Right. It's stigmatized. Those goods are already made in Japan is already associated with cheap stuff. And after the war, as a way to get the Japanese economy going again, the United States government supplied economic aid to Japan to start up these manufacturing companies again to make this cheap stuff. Okay. At the same time, the Japanese had to completely rebuild their industry, their factories. A lot of the cheap goods production was occurred not in factories, but in individual households that were organized to do this often like fine handwork. And you don't have to pay your wife and kids any money. Right. You know, they're they're free labor in a way. And so as Japan is rebuilding its factories post-war, they start manufacturing higher-end goods. They start manufacturing really nice bicycles, televisions, and other electronics, transistor radios, stereo equipment, cameras, cars. Mm -hmm. And as they do that, that cheap goods industry has to move someplace else because the market is still there. Mm -hmm. The people are still buying it. And so it moves to Hong Kong and then it moves to China where it continues to remain today. Mm -hmm. You know, they've got cities dedicated to making like shower curtains. Right, right, right. So I think that's a really important kind of history and that's a, like a really digested sure. Sure. version of it it's longer and a little bit more complicated than that but i think that that's a very important aspect to consider when we think about cheap goods and then if we turn more specifically to novelty goods you have the height of the market and the desire the demand for novelty goods from the 1950s to the 1980s early 90s mm -hmm. and it was a boom time. You had in cities and small towns, you had dedicated magic shops and there were yeah. dedicated novelty shops. Mm -hmm. You know, there weren't even toy stores. They were just stores that sold these weird bananas, novelty goods. Kind of like a Spencer's. Spencer, yes. Yeah, yeah like uh -huh. the novelty shop goes to the mall, right? Yeah. And if you were a teenager of a certain time period, which I certainly was, you went you you know hid from your parents and you went to Spencer gifts because you weren't allowed to and you looked at all the black light stuff and the lava lamps and the you know they had all sorts of kind of like racy things yeah and they still do it was like yeah. slightly illicit but you know really kind of cool yeah Spencer was amazing and then the internet came along and really killed the novelty industry, mm. not just, you know, as an industry as a whole, but the novelty businesses. I don't know of any, well, there's Archie McPhee, right? I think there's- And that's some... actually right near where I live. That's, uh, okay. I'm in Seattle. So that's, yeah. They do still have one brick and mortar store, I think. Yeah. Here. Yeah. But they're really, the last novelty shop I was in was in Toronto, like, I don't know, 10 years ago. We have one- I, that I think you would consider a novelty shop in Pike Place Market in Seattle, but it's like essentially a novelty novelty shop, right? Because it's like, <laughs> it's a novelty itself. It's like a meta yeah, place right. now that exists. Um, but yeah, I think it's called, it's Orange Dracula. I'm going to shout it out because I love it. It's okay. very rare. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And so there were a couple of reasons for that. Probably more than a couple, but a couple I'll Mention in the first is, of course, the rise of eBay and Amazon. You can start get you don't have to, you know, like for everything else, you don't have to go to a brick and mortar shop anymore to get your stuff, whether it's yeah. high end or whether it's cheap. So people can order this stuff online. But I think also the Internet itself became our source of novelty. Mm, yeah. And so, you know, plastic vomit and joy buzzers and whoopee cushions are no longer going to cut it when you can just go online and you can play video games. You can be in a chat room 
you can look at news, you can check your email, you can you can yeah. have novelty all the time. Yeah. Unceasingly. So unceasingly, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and so I think that also killed the novelty. Yeah. 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 That makes sense. And I mean, I guess, do you think that that's a good thing? <laughs> I know that's a complicated question, but maybe that can kind of lead us to a closing conversation about like cheap goods, especially novelties. I would like to know, in your opinion, their merits and yeah. the elements of them that are problematic, you know, whether that be environmentally politically. What are your final thoughts about these types of goods? If you were Jerry Springer, <laughs> and this was your final thought. Well, yeah, this probably won't surprise you. I'm conflict. I'm deeply conflict. Sure. sure. Um, as a material culture person, I love engaging with objects. Mm -hmm. I'm a very analog person in many ways. There's something about the materiality and the concreteness of objects that literally and psychologically grounds us in ways and connects us to our environment and our lived selves, ourselves as human beings, that having experiences through the screen just does not do. And also, you know, I have a little bit of nostalgia for these older ways of doing things. I mean, I remember going shopping on Saturday mornings with my dad and we'd go to, into a Woolworths and I'd see like the whole section of S.S. Adams novelty goods in those like vacuum sealed cellophane packets. Yeah. And I was always so mesmerized by them and they were just so cool. And the, so the thing about novelties in particular is, you know, they do open up these mm -hmm. imaginative worlds. They, you know, they introduce you to things that you never saw before that you couldn't even conceive of. And so in that way, you know, I think that they kind of made your brain bigger, even if it was in the world of play and, and or pranking. Because they very much had a magical quality to them. So much of their ad copy was about magic. Yeah. And what is impossible. Yeah. 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 And they were just things that you were curious about and wanted to figure out. And so that's the kind of stuff that I, I look back on kind of wistfully and uh, an aspect yeah. of our culture that I really miss. At the same time, though, as we've talked about, we have so much <laughs> crap in our lives that we don't need and we don't want. And just to be clear, I'm like not a Marie Kondo person where I think we each should have like eight objects in our house or something like that. I mean, I'm surrounded. We're having this conversation. I'm looking around like I'm surrounded sure. by stuff and I like being surrounded by stuff, but it does come at a cost. There are you know, huge, I think by last count, five or seven mm -hmm. trash gyres in the ocean that are mostly made up of plastic junk. So we can no longer get back to this way of living that we used mm -hmm. to have where we could repair things, we could recycle things. Very few things can actually be recycled. They've done a study about IKEA furniture. It can only be moved twice before it falls apart. Oh, that sounds familiar. Yeah. <laughs> And Ikea, I think, is the largest consumer of Ugh, like yeah. timber in the world. And they're not even making things. Most of their things are made with compressed board and not like, you know, real wood. So it can't be repaired. You can't you can't recycle it. So this stuff ends up in the landfill and it doesn't last very long. A piece of furniture doesn't last as long as it used to. Can you imagine like trying to <laughs> hand down an Ikea bookcase no. to like your kids or something. I mean, the thought is just ridiculous, right? Well, and it's like, I didn't even think about the fact that we've actually gone so far as to not be able to go back because even our most basic materials that we could repair are yeah. not repairable because they're not made with any integrity. So yeah, yeah, we can't, it's hard right. to go back. It's hard to put the toothpaste back in the tube with this one. Yeah. And if you think about fast fashion, Often that can't even be laundered. Yeah. It's made to be yep. worn once or twice, and then you you know you chuck it out. So that's so that's one of the kind of less savory things about all this stuff we have. Another one is, of course, the labor conditions under which most of this stuff is made. And if you can buy, I, I was just talking to somebody about Timu, you know, the cheap website. And so if you can go on Timu and buy a a knit cap for $2. How how much is the labor 
you know, how much are those people being paid to make that stuff? And I often wonder too, sort of more, just sort of more bizarrely, like, do people even understand what they're making sometimes? So these, like, let's say truck nuts, like, do they even, do they have any connection to the things Ugh, they're making? No, probably nuts, not. Yeah. <laughs> and then, I mean, I describe it in my book as like these, mm -hmm. these cycles of degradation, the material is is degraded. The labor we're degrading the labor it takes to make these things. We're also degrading the laborers who have to sell these things, often sold in big box stores like Walmart. And the people working there are not paid often living wages, so they can only afford to buy this sort of yeah. crappy stuff. Ugh. Yeah. Yes. And then finally, if we get back to kind of where one of the places we started. If you think about the language of goods and the fact that we do express thoughts, emotions, ideas about identity through the stuff that we have, if that stuff is crappy, then it really kind of limits the language through which we Ooh, can yeah. speak. Yeah. If that makes sense. Does that make sense? Oh, yeah. No, that absolutely makes sense. And I mean, it just feels like you can take that and just like expand it out and expand it out like the way we have relationships more disposable than they used to be the way that we, yeah. you know, have conversations probably more disposable than they used to be. I think it's like these things can echo out into all parts of our lives because of the way that we re relate to the yeah. things that we own, obviously, is like a very important type of relationship, not just a materialistic one. But, you know, as we talked about, there was like the types of goods that almost felt like a part of your family. The chair that you've repaired yes, for three absolutely. generations that's that has is imbued with a certain type of meaning and personality, whereas your fake vomit, yeah. you have a very different kind of relationship to one that is fun <laughs> right. in many ways, but one that might, right. you know, cheapen some aspects of being a human being, I imagine. Right. Yeah. And if something happens to my my fake vomit, like I'm not going to feel a loss yeah. in the way I would feel a loss if some early or something right. got stolen. Right. But to your very, very good point, my relationship to most of my stuff is not, you know, not all that meaningful. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Well, Wendy, thank you so much. This was such an interesting and fun conversation. Um, I've been in such a novelty hole. And uh, it's nice to be able to talk to someone with such a, <laughs> a vast knowledge of a very specific thing. So thanks again so much for coming on the show. No, thank you. And thank you for, for taking such care in reading my book. I appreciate it. Oh, of course. I loved it. This was American Hysteria. Make sure you check out Wendy Wollison's book, Crap, A History of Cheap Stuff in America. You can find a link in our show notes. If you want to get more of our show, you can become a patron at patreon.com slash American Hysteria, or you can become a subscriber on Apple with Apple Plus. You'll get ad-free episodes as well as bonus content like the talk show that I do with our producer, Miranda, where we tell stories that are related to the topics at hand and also give more of our own opinions, talk about our feelings, and give you a behind-the-scenes look at how the show is made. So come and join our community today at patreon.com slash American Hysteria or by subscribing on Apple+. Plus. This episode was edited and produced by Miranda Zickler, and I'm your host, Chelsea Weber-Smith. Thanks, as always, for listening, and I hope you have a great week.